Okay, our final um, keynote speaker is Ema Coleman. I'm very pleased to welcome Ema here this afternoon. Ema has a background in communications journalism, social media, arts and culture, open data, public sector policy, and organisational change. Phew. Uh, she's worked in local, regional, central government, most recently in the Government Digital Service Cabinet Office, and was named in Wired Magazine's Top 100 Digital Power Influencers List 2011. Change is the new normal. Over to Ema. I really have to change that bio. It's beginning to sound not so good when it's 2011, right? Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, and I'm sure you've had an interesting day with lots of challenges and lots of PowerPoint. So I thought, given that I was the last speaker, I would not do a PowerPoint presentation and just share some observations uh, with you uh, on technology and change and uh, skills that are required to meet the challenges of the future and future organizations. Um, so what I want to talk about is the fact that change is the new normal. Um, and when I was thinking about speaking today, I was remembering a conversation I had probably about 20 years ago with a friend of mine one evening. We were just discussing life and the universe and all that jazz. And I remember saying to him that I, I thought you were supposed to get to a point in your career, um, you know, when uh, you had things figured out, you kind of knew what you were doing, and things got easier. Um, and he said to me, well, uh, probably because he was a philosophy uh, student, uh, he said, why on earth do you think it's supposed to get easier? Okay, life is hard, right? Um, that's the steady state, and once you've accepted life is hard, every day that you can deal uh, with something and get on with it makes it a little bit easier. Um, and the same, I think, is true of change. Uh, we have become used to the comforting myth that for most of us in our working lives, there is a steady state. So we enter the working world we don't know very much. We spend a lot of our time figuring out how to navigate the realities of work, problems and politics of the environment. And we get to a certain point in our career where we pretty much know uh, how things work. And people respect our experience and we can look forward to career advancement and reward based on that knowledge and experience pretty much until we retire. And we understand that change happens and that it can be unsettling. But mostly we think of change as an aberration, something that needs to be tolerated when it makes an unplanned appearance. And that's largely how we think about it. Something that happens, it's almost like a blip in the soundtrack, a momentary challenge to the status quo. That's a slightly irritating thing we have to adapt to, or not, as the case may be. And that things will move on, allowing us to return to our resting state, back to the comfort zone that we've spent all our working lives creating. And we believe that the tools and the techniques and knowledge that we have acquired all of our working lives are what really matters and what's valuable to our organization. And that all we have to do is ride out the temporary storm before things return to normal. And that way of thinking uh, encourages us to rely on the knowledge that we have acquired in the past. And it encourages us to value past experience of a way, as a way of navigating the future. And it creates the kind of individuals, in my view, that we're pretty much all familiar with those who, uh, uh, kind of leaders who nod wisely and say of any new challenge or threat, yeah, that'll never catch on. And I'm sure you have many of those in your own organizations. So that misses the point, really, that in fact, change is the constant steady state and not the aberration. Our professional lives churn with change, markets change, technology changes, channels shift, customers change, competitors change. So I would argue that this is the era of disruption. It's not disruption as an occasional event that we have to deal with, but it's the constant condition of our professional lives. And I think mostly, instead of trying to understand and manage change, our response is largely to try and ignore it, or forget about it, or to fake our way through it, to pretend an engagement or a mastery that we simply, in reality, don't have. So the, the Harvard Business Review talks about this phenomenon as disruption denial, okay? And so as an example, um, I'd outline something like Twitter and so step one is, uh, is usually about confusion. So Twitter makes an appearance in 2006, and you, you don't quite get it, but you kind of sign up for it, and you give it a whirl, and you still don't quite get it. Uh, but you hear what everybody's saying about it, and you understand it might be a big deal, but you really don't get it. So step two is repudiation. And this is where you get very polished at one-liners um, when it turns out that there are loads of other people who don't get it either. So you all group together and say things like, well, too many tweets make for a twat. <laughs> Step three, you end up shaming people who think there might be something in it. Yeah, like I so want to be mayor of Foursquare in my own living room. Okay. And then finally, that's step four, by which time the innovation has actually caught, caught, taken off and can demonstrate value. You kind of have a convenient forgetting then. 
and you act as if you always understood and approved of the new innovation. And you destroy the evidence, pretending that you were a supporter from the start, and you're like, yeah, Twitter, I was so all over that in 2006, right? So, except by the time you actually get to that stage, when you do get to that stage, others, your employees, your competitors, your children, have already figured out exactly what the benefits of the new technology are, and they've become versed in using it. And they have changed their behavior as a result of understanding what the technology can do. And they're simply less inclined to respect your authority on the matter. So, so bit by bit, I think there is a chance that we can make ourselves irrelevant if we're not prepared to keep up with the challenges of that new world. So you have suddenly perhaps less standing in the conversation, or suddenly your authority or the experience you've brought with you from the past doesn't quite count as much as it did before. And I think that's a deeply challenging thing for any professional to suddenly feel that in some way they're being left behind. And I remember very vividly when email came out, I had a colleague who used to use his computer to put his post-it notes on it, right? Because he thought, well, that email lark will never catch on. And he sort of surrounded himself with a bunch of other senior people in the organization who share that same opinion, while everybody else, not necessarily younger, but perhaps a little bit more curious, simply got on with the business of getting to use email and actually find out what it was worth. So we need to understand that in an era when change is the steady state, we need to be much more open and more curious and less dismissive and more reflective. And we have to accept what it's very difficult for any professional to accept when they've built their whole career on knowing what's best or knowing what's right, that we simply don't know what we don't know. And saying, I don't know, is the hardest thing for any leader to say because they're taught that knowing best is what gives us a competitive advantage. Whereas, in fact, being able to say, I don't know, but I'm willing to listen and learn, is probably a far more useful leadership skill. So technology teaches us that if it teaches us nothing else. So products and services are developed at the speed of life. They provide solutions to problems we didn't even know existed yet. You, so you think about the evolution of the disk drive or the floppy disk before laptops were invented, when industry and governments were developing mainframes and servers with the capacity to store gigabytes of information, who was going to use a little floppy disk that could only, couldn't even store a megabyte? So this is what the writer Clay Christensen calls the innovator's dilemma. I'm sure you're all familiar with the book. So a disruptive force emerges in the market, but it doesn't seem like a threat because it doesn't look anything like you've seen before. So like, that'll never catch on. And by the time it gathers momentum and really does catch on, you don't have the skills or knowledge to turn the juggernaut that is your organization around quickly enough to adopt to the new normal. So we do this not only in our professional lives, but I would argue in our personal lives. And I'm sure many of you who are parents will have experienced the confusion of understanding how children and young people actually acquire knowledge today. So I was certainly beaten down trying to say to my teenage son, you need to put together information as building blocks. You need to understand the basics. Because my learning was always about trying to digest facts and figures, whether that was in maths or science or history. Um, and clearly, as a child of the web, my son thinks I'm slightly insane. Because he's, his question would be, why on earth would he waste his time cramming his head with facts? Like, because that's what Google's for, right? So he doesn't need to contain the same knowledge in his head as we had to carry around with us, because it's just a click of a button away. Um, and the, so the value um, that he will bring in the future to his organization is not that he can recite those facts and figures on the spot, because like I said, they're a click away, but what interpretive skills he will bring to his organization or indeed to his own life uh, in using that information. So the, the generation born after 1985 are a very different generation and a very different challenge for the organizations of tomorrow. Um, I would point you to um, a piece of work you'll find online called We the Web Kids. Uh, which is written by the Polish author, Peter Sersky. Um, and he describes how those generational values differ. He says, our view of the social structure is different from yours. Our society is a network, not a hierarchy. We are used to being able to start a dialogue with anyone, be it a professor or a pop star, and we do not need any special qualifications related to social status. The success of the interaction depends solely on whether the content of the message will be regarded as, as important and worthy of reply. And if, thanks to cooperation, continuous dispute, defending our arguments against critique, we have a feeling that our opinions on matters are simply better, why wouldn't we expect to have a serious dialogue with government? So my point is, when change is the new normal, beware the organization who thinks that the old models of leadership, of command and control, will hold much sway with that generation. When we talk about new ways of working and new skills, 
we're not really talking about technology, you know, bring your own device, the cloud, mobile, because in the end, technology is only technology. We are talking about a whole range of other skills that we need to develop. So if you're a leader in an organization, you need to become comfortable with uncertainty. You need to become really engaged with your workforce. And you probably need to accept the fact that uh, leadership doesn't necessarily reside in the places it used to. It can be distributed at all through levels of an organization, at the outer reaches and on the front line. Successful leaders of the future, in my view, will understand that it is not sufficient with this new generation workforce to set out your strategy in the corporate boardroom and expect it to be delivered by slavish adherence just because you say so. Because this generation will expect you to explain it and defend it and discuss it in the open on blogs, through social media, and you will need to be prepared to change your strategy if they can demonstrate a better way. So Daniel Pink, uh, who's the author of the book A Whole New Mind, talks about uh, the most important degree for the corporate world in the future, he says, is not going to be the MBA, it's going to be the MFA, which is a Master of Fine Arts. Um, and he talks about six senses that leaders need to be attuned to and to understand, and it goes back a little to what Steph was talking about in terms of humor. But the six things he says are important are design, story, sympathy, symphony, empathy, meaning, and play. So that element of humor and fun and design is important. And these are the senses that we, the web generation, value most highly and the lens through which they will examine their future employment paths. But there are rewards in adopting these types of approaches. And I think I'd look no further than the approach that has been taken by GDS, uh, where I worked until recently. So a lot of their output and approach and engagement is based around those principles of design and story and empathy with, you know, with the users. Um, and if there was ever a more compelling argument for me or example that changes the new normal, it was recently reading a headline in the Financial Times that said, government website wins design museum award. So I thought, when is the last time we heard design and government and award in the same sentence? So kind of that pretty much sums up the new normal for me. Um, and so I just finished by saying we need to embrace change as the steady state and learn to be more comfortable about what we don't know because I think then we can face the future in the right frame of mind, ready to collaborate to meet the challenges ahead. Thank you. Thanks very much to Ema. Any questions? I just wondered if change is the new normal, is progress the new normal? <clears throat> Are they the same thing? <laughs> yeah, well, perhaps. But I, you know, I'm, I'm really just trying to make that point is I think most people think of change as aberration rather than a steady state. So, yeah, but progress is the same thing, yes. Any more questions? It's been quite a long Sorry. day. There's one down here. Just remind people to say their name. Oh, yeah. uh, hi, I'm Charlotte G, a, a reporter for Government Computing. Uh, I thought the, gen the generational thing you touched on was really interesting, uh, and I was just wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on how, how you, what differences you fundamentally see between how to manage different generations. I don't know. That. Do, you, do you think there's a real difference, and if so, what, what are those key identifiers? Yeah, well, I suppose it's because that generation have grown up, you know, of the web. So they don't see that as something distinct that they had to learn. You know, like I had to learn what was this internet thing and how did it work and how did it operate. And so, you know, they've lived most of their lives online. So all the meaningful things like, you know, meeting people, breaking up with people, all of that stuff. Their understanding of how, of the acquisition of knowledge, you know. For us, you know, the opportunity to go to a university or to access things that were locked inside a wall garden, there was a privilege that was attached to that. You know, MIT now have their courses for free online. So, you know, that ease of access of opportunity. So social status flattens down as well, I think, in terms of that, in terms of universities. So I think their expectation will be that, you know, they will, they will search to find the answer that resonates with them not, and, and resonates with their community and their network, not necessarily the dicta that's handed to them. And so they will be much more free about contacting the chief executive if the chief executive is on Twitter. Right? So they don't see that kind of barrier, that notion of worth and hierarchy and structure. 
Um, so I think there will be challenges to bureaucracies, and we're going to have to look at much more flat kind of working worlds. And you know, we have lived in a world where knowledge is power. You know, where that that there was that expectation that the senior manager, the CEO, had gone to Harvard, had gone to an, you know elite university, had the right to be at that table because of that. Now, when you know, when when you know, excellence is at a click away. You know, average isn't going to cut it anymore. So I think people, there will be people who will rise and succeed in their careers because they are knowledgeable and they are networked more than because they feel they have a God-given right to be there. So I think there's a huge challenge to just the notion that they will accept authority. Um, so I'm not trying to suggest that all our future workforces will be more like children, but you know what I'm saying? They won't just accept things because you say so. I think you're going to have to become much more robust at articulating why. <clears throat> With uh, the increase in change and the, therefore the increase in transition from one technology to another, do you think we're going to come to a point where we're going to start to measure the cost of obsolescence? Yeah, I mean, you wonder, don't you? You wonder whether things will just become more, more interoperable, you know, when the frictions that currently happen between not being able to access one technology on another. You know, you suddenly become annoyed when you're on your iPad and you can't access Flash or whatever because, you know, Adobe is having some sort of war with Apple. You think, sort it out, folks, because this is affecting me. So I wonder, you know, will the cost be less if, those, if systems become much more inter interoperable? And, of course, the cost of production of technology reducing all the time. So, you know, who knows? You know, there may be a sort of a natural exhaustion point. You know, we might end up throwing all the kit out completely and saying, <laughs> go back to pen and paper. <laughs> Okay, can we say thank you very much to Ema?